When's my tank gonna arrive? It's gonna arrive in uh, the 27th. We can send them equipment. I mean, I could, but I'm not, I'm, I don't want to send them equipment. I'd rather just send them like actual units. How many troops do you actually have? Eight against seven. We're gonna make it about even. The Great Eminence. Kido was a man of many contradictions. A noble, but also a deputy, a former prime minister, yet an aspiring power broker. And a great eminence with a lick of touch in politics. Irrelevant, they called him. A done with failure. Nobles and deputies alike liked him to tell him as much. They mingled within the chambers. The 50s, Kido san. The hell with the 50s. That was a long time ago. Was it? It's 1962. It was like three years ago at most. Um. It was a long time ago. The only thing that could bring Kido's affordable uh, jugular and jovial temper to his boiling simmer was a reminder of a time when he had power. A powerless, another contradiction. He sat in the corner of the House of Representatives lounge, the only deputy dressed in a decent suit, who would conduct himself with decent etiquette. Where he sat uh, in a Noah's lounge, he would be laughed out of the room because of his loose cabaret and patterned tie. Kido did not care. When he needed favors, they would come to him. Kido was not someone so easily offended by mockery of his mo mode of dress. No noble, no noble should be angry at his inferiors, nor his equals. Tea, cakes, while other deputies brought bread and bundled rice. The conservatives, liberals, and reformed bureaucrats talked to their leaders freely. Keto knights, even Adwood ones, avoided Keto. He sat alone, undisturbed. A time will come when they would surround him. The first scraps of power left untouched at the heels of his tables. He just needed to wait. I think, I mean, you have one city here. It's worth 30 victory points. So imagine just taking that. Actually, eh, probably won't be quite enough. Because you're going to get there on five more days. The Ideologue. In the suburbs near the Imperial Palace, rested the living spaces and the homes of the Kaizoku, Japan's nobility and the Emperor's kin. When Emperor Meiji moved his court to Tokyo, all of them followed from low to high by the heels of his palanquin. A layer of dew covered the courtyards, rooftops, and the eaves of the place. Thickets of leaflets, of leafless trees ruffled whenever the stray breeze blew between their naked forms as they trembled from the cold of Japanese late winter. The Kono residence was here stately, but not immodest. Japanese style, but not ancient. Hints of verdant glass covering patches here and there. The sight of bundling spring. A hush fell over Futumoro... Bum... From Immoro's Kone's house, he heard everything to be quiet as possible in his house. His wife was in the attic, searching for old articles of clothing that they can give to their neighbor's son. He took tea to his study, whose siblings' doors are embossed with the symbol of the Kono house, uh, highest of all re regions of the emperor. For once dressed in his yakuda, he sat cross-legged, a crass gesture against noble etiquette. In front of him were the treaties from the outside world, from, from outside Japan. As he had always been the case since his use, American diplomacy fascinated him. These days, everything was quiet. For 20 years since his ministry, Japan had managed to carry on, uh, stabilizing his newfound emperor, empire against weakening uh, Western imperialism. He did not contact Yukosomi much these days. One did not intentionally seek out one's own failure. It had been years since he had seen the emperor, who he tried to dissuade from a war with America. Since then, his imperial majesty had not called on him. When he did, Fumio Karyo would be ready to answer that call. Country is never too big for one man's ideas. We'll be arriving there soon. Shadow Shogun. Let's take a sip of my drink. The sun, the sun shone brightly. They got a central station, the transportation hub of the prefecture. The main commute for thousands of citizens, and today the hosting grounds for representat representatives from Nigagadai's third district. Kayuko Tanaka's speech. Flanked by local police, Tanaka was speaking to a sea of rural Japanese today. His constituents, his roots, and most importantly, his people. Amongst the sea were signs of support from the stout representatives, the Nagadai Mountain Citizen Association's back Sanakai Kanegui. A very good morning to you lovely citizens of Nagadi. I have some brilliant news for you from our beloved province. Takana boomed in his district, uh, distinctly rural accent, his speech drowned out by applause of the crowd. Many of you share your concerns with me. Also Tanaka-san, the Hayusa line is overflowing. We can't get to Sedai or Toyoma without uh, cramming ourselves in. I hear you, my people. I hear you loud and clear, and I make sure those arrogant bureaucrats in Tokyo hear your voices, too. The Akushin Line, that was the only train line traversing through Nagari Province, uh, Niagara in 1962 was still a very rural province, dominated by agriculture and those economic characteristics that play very much into Nagari's favor. Tanaka was always championing himself as a man of the people, one who rose from the ranks and broke Tokyo's bureaucratic bubble, and to this day retained his confidence in his constituents through generous construction and development projects. So today, my fellow citizens of Nagadi, I present to you the foundations of the Jujutsu 
Shin Kassen line. Cameras flashes and applause drowned out the ending of Tanaka's speech. The ceremonial ribbon was cut. Tanaka himself was silent during the affair and broke the first ground as the leader should. He did not need any more words to justify or explain himself. He let the results of his labor speak for itself and for his constituents. How much have I lost? I don't know what you mean by that. Inner Division has arrived! Fantastic! Um... You're in the capital. I guess I will send you... I'll send you right there, because there's nobody actually in that province right now. Shoya no Yokai. He has a shipment of 1570 units of logs that delayed. If you accidentally could excuse me, I'm running several major shipment operations right now. The shipment from Yuyun, uh must be delayed for fears of complications. Pharaoh Prince Takati, I will receive you again shortly. Kishu Nobusuki uh, hung up the telephone and let out a deep sigh before pouring himself a glass of wine. Domain Christopher Callan Province, 1954 Vintage. It's just business. Kishi thought to himself as he flipped over the ledger. Plain and simple, the ledger had become famous for being the devil's hamburger among Kishi's subordinates, opponents, and sometimes allies. Procurement, 1570 units of logs. Uh, Chinese settlement, 70 kilometers west of Harbin. Get kilometer to Siki to ensure all logs are in workable condition. Shipment 2, Showa Steelworks, Rojodi Complex. Logs to be processed and sent immediately to resource extraction. Legally speaking, a deputy such as Kishi would not have access to such resources, let alone such executive capacity over state-owned operations in another sovereign state. However, Machuko, or Manchu, as Kishi insisted, was his personal point of pride. Who else could have industrialized an uncivilized savage backwater in such a short period of time and transformed it into the Empire's industrial heartland? Kishi flipped to another section of leisure, this time with a la uh, lapel... But the label, Liabilities and Hazards at the top. The first page was bathed in red stamps, signifying liability eliminated. Almost poetically metaphorical for the sheer bloodshed, empathized by the page alone. Bureaucrats, officers, politicians, students. Nobody escaped the eyes of the devil of Showa. Kishi rang the intercom button on the bottom of his desk. Schedule a meeting with General Akaimoto Thursday next week at Chimioso Jiro. The Manchurian Connection. Oh, I, I, and we're only about half an hour in. So you have not missed too much. Just really the uh, the initial setup of the campaign. So you haven't really missed too too much. Well, let's hire the only person with a face. And how about you just go spy on those stinky Americans in Washington D.C. If you get any information off of them, and we'll kind of see. Well, it'll be interesting to see what the United States actually does. Hitler named Bormann as his successor. I don't think that makes any difference here. But it'll be interesting to see what pathway the United States takes, and if that kind of differs a lot from what we did. Decisions available. Like, what else can we do? Send advisory battalions. Give them more strength. Division attack plus 10% is not bad. So you know what? Let's send the 10% um, boost against you. Advisory battalions. Northwestern China has always been a backwater. A death sentence for the careers of once prominent. A required retirement home for the weary and a containment ground for the most rabid of the Imperial Japanese Armory, officers, and personnel. While well, it's an odd mix of competence and incompetence, but sufficient for peacetime operations such as anti-bandit raids as well as basic garrisoning, this shall not suffice for an actual war or a large-scale rebellion. With the escalations in Teshabao's rebellion, it would be wise for us to pour more trained and uh, effective assets into Northern China area army. Specifically, deploying motorized or airborne assets, uh, this would be used for us to intervene readily Mongolian steps in case Prince D's government falls to the Teshabai's forces. In any case, we should be ready to forward cadres uh, of the units and send to Meijing as soon as possible to act as forward operating units and as well as advisors to the Meijing National Army. Hopefully, with development, we can increase fighting capa uh, capabilities for the Prince's army. With luck, we can extend our influence far into the northeast again against the Russians. Oh, yeah, can I send any planes to you? We can send up to zero planes. Okay, we're not going to do that. Tsukayadi. Kuyo Sakamoto has almost overnight become one of the most recognizable figures in Japan. At least his voice was. His new song, Oh, uh, You O Miko Oroku, I Look Up As I Walk. You should. Uh, you don't want to look at the floor, or else you're going to bump into shit. Now plays on radios all across the nation. A whole citizenry of uh, enraptured by the smooth timbre of his voice and gentle sadness of the lyrics. It's a song of lost love. 
but not a mournful one, full of regret and hope in equal measure. The song's appeal has not been constrained to my national borders. It was popularized across the sphere as part of the home industry's push to spread contemporary Japanese color culture amongst its allies. It even became popular within the United States despite the government's hostility to Japanese exports of all kind. In the Anglophone country, the song was renamed uh, Sukayai Sukiyaki after a beef hot pot dish. It's an attempt to make the title shorter and more recognizably Japanese. The bright beauty of the song speaks to people from Tokyo to Washington. It reminds people that despite their differences, they all know the pain of longing and the pale ache of a lost love. Ten political power. Hell yeah, we did it. Um, so after this, you know, let's go for 50 political power. I do like um, in the new order that we've, we've been doing. It's we're about 40 minutes into the stream. And we've only done like one focus, which is... Always oh, fantastic. We don't want to make sure our tank dies, though. That's it's kind of important for our operation here. When are you going? When are you going to be in our capital? You're going to be in our capital in two days, so you should be there f fast enough. We go into here. We want to look at current conflicts. We've got you down to eighty-two percent. Now you are going to capitulate. Okay, well that worked out pretty well. Akira Kosawa's releases Sanjuro. One of Japan's most eminent filmmakers, Akira uh, Akira Saka, Sawa, has released his most prominent uh, recent opus. The Kari film titled Sanjuro, a sequel to Yujibibo, released the previous year. Sanjuro stars Kurosawa's frequent collaborator Toshiro Mifune and is based off Shijiro Yamanodo's short story Hibi Hanan. Critics have appreciated the thematic shift from Yojibo as Senjuro is now set in a fortress town instead of a far-flung backwater, which many have panned for being too western-influenced. Rumors following the production of Yojibo include Kurosawa being threatened by the to Toko and fears close to the military, There's only, but there has not been any concrete proof of such. By far and wide, critics have lauded the film, with many praising the perfectly synergized mix of comedy, action, and adventure, and on the technical end, Many have also praised the cinematography of the film, revolutionary for the time, as well as Mifuto's incredible performance. The film has also ousted Jimbo as Japan theaters, another milestone broken by Kurosawa. Rumor has it that Kurosawa is following begin production of the next film titled Akagi. <laughs> While he is uh, confirmed to be inspired by another work of Sejiro Yamoto's short stories, rumors that he has uh, considered Foydor. Those guys see his work as another source of inspiration are still unfounded. Japanese culture has entered a golden age. Good evening. AV Geek Forever. And there we go. We have, we have now won our war in the north. Fantastic. Managing request support. Status report 57A North China Area Army. Truants for brevity. Forward. Prince... The Prince, forces of the Mongolian United Autonomous Government, has been battling the forces of Yubusain to be his rebel government from the steppes of Mongolia. Mongolia, while still backward compared to the riches of Manchuria and China, is still a vital communication logistic hub for transporting through Beijing. As such, the Prince's forces should be aided by the forces of the North China Area Army as much as possible. I just won the war, just so you know. Colonel Kadara, representing our chief of staff, have come up with three proposals. A. Provision for air support from the 17th 33rd Fighter Groups, as well as Bomber Group from Jensen Kadai. The lowest possible commitment we can make. This would still mean significant. This would still mean significantly for the president's forces. Intelligence reports state that their air capacities of the rebels are lacking. B. Same as option A, with the additional provision, the 33rd Reserve Battalion as an advisor group for the prince's forces on the ground. This would increase the land capacity of Beijing's army, but might be seen as a waste of resources. The prince loses the war in the step. C. Same as option A, but with an added provision of the Second Armored Brigade. The heaviest commitment we are able to make, this will increase the Prince's uh, chance of victory exponentially at the cost of massive lo political loss for if the Prince were to be defeated. I mean, we've already won. So I guess we'll make the largest commitment because we've already done it. Love T and No. Suggest I go Tagaki? Which one is Tagaki? The Liberals, okay. Oh, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. An unusual request. Our Manchurian consultant has a rare communique from the Kusside Rejevesky, one of our old useful idiots from Harbin. In his capacity of Vods of the Russians, he demands in further bipolar language the return of Blavosgeshtsk, a region in the far north of Manchuko, which contains its hometown of the same name. The region is not particularly impressive in terms of mineral wealth, 
and it is full of ethnic Russians who we have no reason to displace. The Manchurians expressed their profound indifference to the matter uh, when it was brought to their government, so there is no need to bother getting them the rubber stamp it. All the other authorities concerned have made it clear they don't care about the frozen stub of the land full of Russians, and Rodetsky is offering us rights to the resources in the far eastern Siberia once he secures the region. Though unlikely to happen, it will allow for some interesting investment opportunities should he succeed. So there is nothing to lose from seeing the Atlantic question. We may as well have sent... Uh, we may as well just send the request up the pipeline to the diet and see what comes of it. We should hear back in a month or so. Get 25 flicking of power. So we're giving you some power. You're fascist. We are fascist. So, I mean, it works out for both of us, I guess. And you're trying to seed... This region, I think? I, I actually don't know which reason we're actually seeding to you. Okay, so our troops are coming back. We're back on the 25th. Yeah, so you two guys are still fighting. I, I don't think we have any reason to side with one of these guys over the other. We lose this ability because of some brawl. The Vladivostok brawl. I'm guessing people are fighting around here. That's fine. Don't worry about it too much. There's nothing in the event description. So what can he do? Apparently we are more in debt than we actually have money. What am I actually building? We're building? Yeah, we're building military factories. Uh, you can... How about you go to America? Go to, like, one of those ports. We have four units here. But I wanted... Remember, I wanted, I wanted two of you to go to San Francisco, please. Not that I would expect us to go to war with the United States. At least not anytime soon. Guys, okay, so yes, yeah, so you guys are going to dock. I mean, a full invasion of the United States would almost be impossible, I think. Like, what are all of you guys doing? Major Jane's declared war on the People's Revolutionary Council. Um, I mean, that still works out for us. You need to have at least GDP higher than the debt. Yeah, pay off some of the debt. Whatever little amount of debt we have. Let's also decrease the military budget for right now. So let's report to the Empire. Kishi doesn't have a path. Which one is Kishi? I don't know. They might not be here quite yet. We still have 35% uh, approval, so I think that's pretty good. Tactical position. We can launch a slander campaign. Is there anything we can do in here? Not really. So all we can really interact with is this. Right now we have... It's going to be a support of the House of Peers. I, I don't know how many seats we have. You know what? Let, let's, let's try this. There we go. We have 156 seats. Oh, there we go. We have 156 seats. Okay. Kishi Ku's the government. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll try not to be cooed. How many troops do you guys have? Six to eight. But I don't think I can send you volunteers, because now we, we don't want to be involved in this war. So unfortunately, you just have to fight this war for yourself. I'm hoping you win against the People's Revolutionary Council, because that would be good for us. How far does our reach go? It goes up to um, you guys here. Like, I wouldn't mind if I could like somehow incorporate all of this into China in the future. Training the Mongolian army. Today, Toyota Kun... Yeah. Pause the game. Pause the game. Paused? Yes, okay. Hey, Toyota Khan. Fucking hot day out, isn't it? Said young Mongol as he entered the sergeant's tent. Don't be stupid, Alton. And don't you fucking dare call me Kun. I'm still your superior for fuck's sake. All right, Toyota-san, said Alton as he stilted but clear enough Japanese. Sergeant Major Hayata Toyota. 
had been reassigned as an advisor to the Mongolian platoon two months ago, part of the first observation regiments that were deployed to Meijiang. His job was simple, train the Mongols in accordance to the doctrines and traditions of the Imperial Japanese Army. Um, seems easy, he initially thought, until he actually had to train the soldiers. The Meijing Army was a hot podge of auxiliaries, former bandits, and professional troops. Hardly any grunt was able to understand Japanese, let alone converse in it. The language barrier, as well as the extreme prejudice and contempt that the Japanese advisors held towards the Mongols, made his unit integration near impossible, and Toyota's uh, unit was no difference. Look, Alton, don't get me wrong, I still think you're a useless little shit, but you're slightly a cut above the rest, and slightly above is good enough for me. So what's, so what's the point of you calling me? Well, I'm putting you in I'm putting you in for squad leader. I've seen you fight against those rebels, and trust me, I know a good soldier when I see one. Not afraid to take on a machine gun nest. Not afraid to take on any prisoners. Oh, not afraid to not take any prisoners. Sergeant Toyota walked out, out for a cigarette and, and patted Aldon on the shoulder on the way out. In solitude, Aldon wondered if fighting Mongol countrymen was worth it. But to him, as philosophic as it might be seemed, joining a Japanese was his ticket up in life. Japan can be summarized in one world, corruption. I'm- look, I'm not overextended. You think all of- like, all of this is overextension? I don't think so. There's only, what, like, a 200 million people in, like, this government? Don't worry about it, we're all good. Do you guys go to war? I, like, you guys go to war at some point, don't you? I know there's at some point some contention between these two governments, but I don't remember correct, 100%. Mongolian Civil War. Did you take territory off of them? In a shocking turn of events, the world watched in awe as remnants of the Red Army based in Mongolia declared war upon the Corps of Prosperity Spheres of Mongolia and won. The peace treaty stipulates that the Sphere will not intervene in the Red Army's activities in the East. A sure sign of expansion's goals for the leader. Um... Are, are you sure? I'm, I guess they technically won. There's no war between India. Okay. I mean, I would have joined the war, ju just so you know. Okay, so uh, okay, so you guys did see that territory, which is basically hot garbage. The importance of Manchurian steel. Manchuria had been a prime position of Japan for many decades now. The vast tons of steel located in said northeastern region of China had become the cornerstone stock for the entire cross prosperity sphere. Iron would be mined from the earth in huge quantities and then brought over to the cities in the south to be smelted and processed. From there, the steel would be shipped across the rest of the sphere day after day, week after week. The demand for Manchurian steel never ceased. In fact, it only seemed to grow more insistent by the hour. Steel was a pillar upon which nearly every part of modern existence was built. With Manchuria having no real competition in terms of steel production, it was vital to ensure that all was well with the economy there. Should it fall behind, the precarious weapon supply and demand could easily start to unravel. The local Manchurian government was required to make regular and particu uh, particularly detailed reports to the financial situation of the steel industry. While the steel was still in Manchuria, it was kept closely guarded throughout the entire journey. It was not uncommon for the military to directly oversee the transportation of some shipments, even going as far as the stationed soldiers abo uh, aboard along with the occasional Navy warship. It became something of a common joke to claim that stealing state secrets was easier than running off with a single steel bar. Ensure continued prosperity. Get 1% stability. Hell yeah. We're actually at 96%. Which is not so bad.